Good morning and welcome again from my side. I would like to thank everyone who has already joined, already joined us this early. And I would like to welcome you to our online conference, DASICON 2022, which is titled Sustainability, Security and Stability, the Future of Food. My name is Valentin Frick and as president of this year's DASICON, I am honored to be moderating this opening panel together with my two vice presidents, Mareike Wiederholt and Melanie Petrov. Um, before we start, I would like to wish a very warm welcome to Ambassador Emil Briggs, Ambassador Annika Markovic, as well as Austrian Federal Minister for Agriculture, Regions Tourism, and Tourism, Elisabeth Köstinger, and Austrian Federal Minister for Climate Action, Environment, Energy, Mobility, Innovation and Technology, Frau Leonor Gewessler. Uh, on behalf of the whole DASICON team, I would uh, like to express our gratitude to all of the speakers who have uh, decided to join our conference um, because it is, it is really our speakers who are shaping this conference with their expertise and their experience. I would also like to take a second to thank the Diplomatic Academy for their incredible support which we have received over the past year in organizing this conference. For example, even though uh, we had to move this conference online, we can still use the <laughs> Diplomatic Academy today to organize everything behind the scenes. And we are incredibly thankful for the support which we have received. And I'm also delighted uh, to announce that um, the Academy's director, Ambassador Emil Briggs, has agreed to say a couple of words to greet everyone. So I will leave the floor to you, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you very much, Mr. Frick, and, and welcome also from my side. Uh, actually, I am here only the, the virtual host. The real heroes are our students who organize uh, this conference uh, in not so easy times. It's not just because of what's happening uh, because of the, of the pandemic, but also, as we know, our issues are uh, urgent. But I think it's, it's, it's a good example that we cannot choose and pick our conflicts. We have to tackle them all at the same time. And I think our ministers, and welcome to Elizabeth Kösting and Leo Norge Isla, they know what I am talking about, that these sort of issues um, uh, are, are unfortunately on the plate of everyone who is, uh, who is active in politics. Uh, I think the, the topic uh, zero hunger is a, a very good topic, especially if we look at it uh, from the point of view of our students here. We, our students come from around the globe, they share experiences um, uh, of uh, developed and developing countries. They come from different academic backgrounds uh, and they understand that they, if they want to have an impact on these sort of issues, on the SDGs especially, they have to use all the abilities they have from various, from various fields. So uh, I'm really grateful that uh, DASICON uh, has been able to organize what they have been organizing. I promised later on to speak also on the panel, but now let me just thank everybody uh, who accepted this invitation, uh, especially uh, all the speakers, uh, our two federal ministers. I'm happy that on, on these issues, we have uh, female uh, ministers here on the board. I guess overall, there is a female majority um, uh, throughout the day, uh, which is not a bad thing either. Unfortunately, your director is still male, but who knows in the future. So welcome and enjoy the day. Thank you, Ambassador Briggs, for your introductory remarks uh, and also for kicking off today's conference. I would also like to issue a very warm welcome to our audience. My name is Melanie Petrov. Uh, our special thanks go to our sponsors who made today's event possible. And first of all, thank you to Stadt Wien for their generous uh, contribution and to Magister Thomas Resch. I would also like to extend our gratitude to Club DA, who connects DA graduates and DA friends since 1969, and who will also host a networking event at the end of DASICON 2022. And finally, I want to thank the Swedish Embassy for their support. Sweden is a pioneer of food sustainability and uh, in Europe and a role model for climate-friendly and climate-smart food. 
And I will now ha I will now hand over to the Swedish ambassador Annika Markovic for her welcome remarks. And thank you, Ambassador, for joining us today. You may have the floor now. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here. And uh, of course, we are meeting today in a very difficult circumstances. Uh, the security in Europe is being threatened and uh, this has not been the case for so many years. So I think the topic that you have chosen, uh, food sustainability and food security is even more relevant today. Um, and I'm really happy that I can participate in, in opening uh, today's uh, uh, meeting. So I want to highlight five points that goes down to the heart of the Swedish priorities for, the, uh, for sustainable food production and sustainable food consumption. And the first one is how to ensure access to safe and nutritious food for all. The second point is how to shift to sustainable consumption patterns where we all have to do our part. The third is how to boost nature positive production. I also want to say a few words about how to advance equitable livelihoods and how to build resilience, especially against shocks and stress. So on the first topic to how to ensure access to safe and nutritious food for all, it's important to underline that everyone must have access to healthy, affordable and safe food in sufficient quantities and quality. And in addition, my country, Sweden, underlines the special nutritional needs of women and their right to equal access to resources. Because sustainable food production and long term sustainable productivity growth should be promoted at the same time as we take steps to reduce food waste in both production and in consumption, through investments in better infrastructure, circular business models, and the transformation of the informal sector. On the second point, how to shift to sustainable consumption patterns, we believe it's crucial to bring about a transition to healthy and sustainable eating habits. To transform people's consumption patterns, we also have to pay special attention to the social and economic factors and to people who are in vulnerable situations, especially women and children. Sweden wants to promote global and nationally adapted goals and indicators based on the 2030 agenda, which is really our blueprint for a sustainable world. On the third point, how to boost nature positive production, we find that a balanced and integrated approach is crucial in shaping and implementing goals, policy instruments and measures. Sweden emphasizes in this context the importance of research and innovation, as well as how to disseminate and, and ap apply these results in the society. We need to then see joint efforts by policymakers, by authorities, uh, by the business sector and civil society in ensuring this shift to sustainable food systems and a swift integration of new knowledge into the system. So we want to improve the links to and the synergies with global environment and climate efforts. That's an obvious one. So my fourth point, how to advance equitable livelihoods. Again, gender equality, human rights, democratic values, and rule of law, fundamental in achieving fair livelihoods and environmentally, socially, and economically sustainable developments. And finally, we need to build resilience to vulnerabilities, to shocks, and to stress. And we will continue to draw attention to increasing world hunger and to factors affecting food security, including conflicts, climate change, inequitable living conditions. And Sweden will work in an inclusive way to ensure greater consideration for the environment, including biodiversity, and work to strengthen the resilience to the effects of climate change and conflict, especially then focusing on low-income countries, but also to improve the capacity to prevent, to discover, and to respond to health risks associated with insecure food supplies. It's essential to safeguard sustainable consumption and production. So stronger links between long-term development cooperation, humanitarian aid 
and peace building are crucial in creating this sustainable food system that we want. So good luck with the discussion today. I'm really looking forward to listening in and thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you so much, Ambassador Markovic. Really appreciate that you took the time and about your contribution. Yeah, also a warm welcome from my side as well. My name is Mareike Wiederholt. Um, I will give you now some further information when it comes to the conference. And also, uh, I would like to show my hereby um, to express our sincere gratitude to Sontor, Nespresso, Makava, and Foslauer. So thank you for your generous donations and contribution. We are grateful um, for your support. Um, in, to, in addition to their donations, we appreciate their commitment to sustainability. For example, Zontor is convinced that everyone can contribute to the promotion of organic farming, sustainable society, and a sustainable environment as well. Throughout their actions, they would like to inspire and motivate everyone to become active themselves. Furthermore, Makava are dedicated to recycling and sustainability, so the ingredients of their products are organic and obtained um, from fair trade or directly from the local region. Also, Makava deliberately avoiding using colorings, flavorings, and preservatives. Also, um, First Lauer are strongly committed to the areas of recycling, sustainability, and environment and climate protection for more than over 15 years. So they are continuously working on the new approaches and solutions and place great importance on transparency presenting their efforts. Also in a time of diminishing um, natural resources, climate change, and consumers who are becoming more aware of the environmental responsibility of brands, Nespresso is becoming increasingly aware of their sustainable impact, social, financial, and environmental aspects as well. Um, and furthermore, I really would like to, to um, thank to our teams and the heads. Um, the significant rise in productivity from our team was massive, so which has helped us achieve um, our target and goals as well. So I thank you for all um, being patient and focusing on the goal that matters the most to us. So I'm glad that we made such a good team and took the conference to another level. So the time and effort that you have put in are just amazing. So without each of you, it might have not been possible. So I therefore would like to show my deep appreciation. Furthermore, in particular, I would like to personally thank Lydia Lünhardt, who was a great head of speakers, Lara Siebrecht as great head of logistics, Flario Barofio as head of sponsoring, Daniel Hopkins as head of marketing. So, and also all other members who really took part in the preparation of our conference. Furthermore, I would like to give you a short outline of our conference that you have a bit of an overview about everything. So uh, we are pleased to present two panels and eight breakout sessions in total. And so, for example, like food security and international relations, every step counts is also quite important for us. Um, the SDG2 Zero Hunger, which will follow afterwards, and also digitalization and technology and food production, just to mention a few of them. Furthermore, generating participants and interaction remains one of our key priorities, and therefore all sessions will be rather brief, lasting approximately about uh, 45 minutes. So two breakout sessions also will take place at the same time, and you can easily jump between the sessions. So each session will be moderated by one of our university students as well. So after a free introductory remarks, the floor will be given to our speakers and um, a further period is allowed it to questions, allowing your pre, um, to you to present your inputs as well. So our moderators can choose from a set of questions, either from the audience or pre-selected questions um, from our students as well. So therefore, we also encourage um, an exchange of ideas and views. So not only the speakers, but also of you as audience uh, we would highly appreciate it and also maybe just to remark from 11 a.m onwards you can start to choose between the specific sessions um, so some further general information now a bit about the code of conduct i would furthermore like to point out a few technical necessities and also raise awareness everyone will be muted in the beginning of each session and i will warmly encourage you to ask questions at any point of the panel via the chat function so uh, when it comes to the chat function questions can be submitted via zoom chat by sending a message to questions so there are also two options submit a question which the moderator then reads out to the panelist or submit a question and asked to take the floor yourself. In addition, you can also switch back and forth. Um, so still be free, um, would you like to do or to participate, but we will highly appreciate if you will take part. 
Okay, so now um, I will come to my introduction. Um, it's an honor to welcome two very special guests to our conference today. So who, despite a rather busy schedule, managed to devote time um, to our event today, for which we would really like to express our sincere gratitude. So first of all, we are delighted to present the Austrian Federal Minister of Agriculture Regions and Tur Tourism, Ms. Elizabeth um, Köstinger. She is a member of the Austrian People's Party, UVP. Before considering a current position, Ms. Köstinger served as Minister of Sustainability and Tourism from 2017 to 2019. Um, she was also first president of the National Council and Secretary General of the ÖVP between 2009 and 2017. She represented Austria as a member of the European Parliament. Furthermore, I would like to um, also uh, highly uh, pleased to present Leonor Gewessler, the Austrian Federal Minister of Climate Action, Environment, Energy, Mobility, Innovation and Technology in the current federal government between between 2008 and 2014. Ms. Gewessler was director of the Green Foundation from 2014 until 2019. She was served as head of Austria's largest environment charity and lobbying group, Global 2000. Ms. Gewessler uh, is an active member of the Greens. By January 2020, she also became minister in the government of Chancellor Sebastian Kurz. So really well, welcome to both of you. I am really appreciate that you took the time here today. So first of all, I will give now the floor to Elisabeth Köstinger. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, dear President, uh, Valentin Frick, uh, Ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having me at the DASICON conference and giving me the opportunity uh, to talk to you today. Food as well as food production is one of the most important but also controversial topics nowadays, especially since the corona pandemic hit human mankind. So the corona pandemic made clear that food supply is crucial task for countries to provide sufficient amounts of food to their people. We as uh, Austrian government uh, made sure that the food supply was maintained throughout the pandemic and uh, especially these quite hard weeks uh, of lockdown and closed borders. It became clear quickly that locally produced food enhanced the food supply resilience in general. In particular, a high degree of self-sufficiency is pivotal. This is why the common agricultural policy, as well as the Ministry of Agriculture, focuses on increasing regional and local food production in the agricultural sector. There was also a significant increase of demand for locally produced food, especially the number of customers using digital platforms selling locally resourced products has increased tremendously during the times of lockdown. This also shows how important it is to push digitalization in the field of agriculture, food production, and in the field of marketing as well. Digitalization is key to foster sustainability on many levels without little to no trade-offs. So the crisis has also made people more aware of food itself. They want to know how about the food origin, how it was produced and whether it meets the ecological and ethical standards. So marketing studies by the Austrian Armour Marketing show a clear customer trend towards regional and seasonal food. In order to meet the consumer's demand, we need to nurture the regional food supply chain in order to function long term. This especially is important in time of a non-crisis. In order to this, I truly believe that the public sector has to lead by example. This is why uh, we has set uh, the goal to increase the availability of regional and seasonal food in public institution. So our aim is to increase the share of sustainability and seasonally produced food in the federal minister's kitchens and canteens in lines with the so-called Aktionsplan Nachhaltige Beschaffung. Another step towards securing regional food supply is the implementation of the so-called Strategie Kulinarik Österreich. This strategy is based on a nationwide coherent marketing and distribution strategy. 
The centerpiece is the red, white, red armor label. It guarantees that every single production stage was carried out in Austrian without exceptions. In total, there are three officially recognized quality labels that guarantee Austrian origin. First of all, the AMA label for agriculture products and food products, the AMA bio or organic label, and the AMA genusregion label used for agriculture direct marketing, manufacturers and restaurants. The quality labels guarantee consumers, first of all, regional origin of the food, high product quality, so also short routes of transportation, which is very important, traditional craftsmanship and family-run businesses and farms. As I mentioned before, consumers are paying more and more attention to the origin of food. This is why the Austrian government is clear in favor for a mandatory origin labeling of food and food products. This very week, I formed an alliance with 14 EU member states, including Germany, to call on the European Commission to come up with a proposal to introduce mandatory origin labeling throughout Europe. This will be a significant step towards more transparency for consumers, more added value for our farmers and protecting the climate. By buying more regional products, we strengthen our local family businesses and support short sustainable supply chains. And this has a very positive impact on local economies, but also contributes towards protecting the environment. So buying local reduces especially transport-related emissions. And this leads me to the issue of climate change. Agriculture and forestry are the sectors most affected by climate change. Austria already implementing ambitious measures for climate mitigation and adaption. The agro-environmental program in Austria, the so-called ÖPUL program, includes many measures that are relevant for climate change mitigation and adaption. In addition to the new CAP strategic plans, we put a very special focus on climate and environment via both mandatory and voluntary measures. So the high number of farmers adopting climate-friendly measures proves that Austrian farmers are willing to do their share to combat climate change. It is therefore for utmost importance to support local farmers as well as regional supply chains by buying regional products and food. This allows us to protect but also appreciate the work of our farmers and reward them their social and environmental contribution. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Minister Kostinger, for also taking the time and really your contribution. Now I would like to hand over um, to Minister Gewessler. Um, we would be happy to hear about your contribution as well. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. And uh, first of all, thanks a lot for having me at this conference. It's really a, a true pleasure, even though I have to admit it's not easy um, to find the right starting point for our topic today because we have um, the events unfolding in Ukraine, which are deeply disturbing, completely unacceptable. And um, I hope that we um, find soon a way out of this situation, because I listened to Emil Briggs' uh, analysis on, on TV last night. So I, I see your lucid analysis on the situation, but um, I have to disagree with you on one point that you mentioned before. I, at least for my part, didn't expect to have to deal with war in Europe when I took over this post two years ago. But um, you can never take anything for granted, I think, is the lesson we learned from, from this situation. But at the same time, we don't need a lot of thinking to find the links between what's, going, what's currently going on in Ukraine and um, our topic today, because if we anticipate that the conflict will have a worrying impact on the prices of fossil gas and oil, which are sky high already now. And we're not even talking about the fact that Ukraine and Russia are the largest exporters of grain uh, worldwide. So of course, this will inevitably have an effect, this crisis on uh, our food systems as well. And that's, not, that's especially true for countries of the global south, 
but also in Europe, I think we are increasingly confronted with challenges to our food systems. So at the topic of your conference couldn't be any more timely and relevant. So thanks a lot also for organizing this today. We have the challenges that climate change poses. Elizabeth, uh, thanks also for, for pointing to the fact how urgent this is to, to deal with uh, the issue. Droughts, floods, heavy weather inc becoming increasingly fre frequent with the climate crisis. Currently, if we think of it, Southern Europe has one of the, is experiences is experiencing one of the worst droughts in decades, yet another mark that we have uh, a heating planet that we have to deal with. The loss of diversity is a second big challenge to our food system. We have fewer and fewer varieties of breeds and plants and animals that are being cultivated, raised and traded and maintained throughout the world. So in, this also means a loss of uh, genetic diversity, which poses a risk to our food, food security by undermining resilience, crisis resilience, by um, exposing us more, making us more vulnerable to threats as pests, as pathogens and climate change. And I think the, the message is, is clear, feeding people, securing food security and enhancing the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity and fighting climate change are closely interlinked and closely interdependent goals. So as you can see, if you ask me as a minister for climate action and environment on the starting points of today's debate, I will tell you, I will talk to you about uh, climate, about biodiversity, about our energy systems. And of course, these are closely interconnected. But if you ask me what I think will be crucial when it comes to food systems in the coming years, then I think it will be crucial that we increase the value we attach to our food and how we handle it not just for ethical and moral reasons, which already weigh high, but I'd like to add three more reasons to it. Firstly, the climate crisis will make food production less secure and thus also be a stress on, uh, on, 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 on costs. So will make, uh, if food production is less secure, it will be more expensive. That's why we have to really do anything to halt climate crisis, uh, roll out renewables, there is yet another link to the current situation unfolding in the Ukraine. We need to gain en energy independence from uh, Russia, from Russian gas. Second reason, um, emissions caused by food production, methane, but also CO2 to transport. Already Elizabeth also mentioned that we need to attach a higher value to locally produced food, to seasonal products, to regain appreciation. What what meat is actually about and what a valuable uh, food uh, stuff it is. So treating it like something special, not like a cheap um, thing that if it goes bad, okay, it goes bad. No, it's something very special in our diets. And thirdly, for the sake of biodiversity, we, we need to reduce the intensity with which we handle our soil. Soil is a commodity that's, that's really stressed in our systems. So soil protection is not only crucial for securing food supply, but also for the fight against the climate crisis. And so there's at least three more reasons why it's so crucial to attach more value to our food and more value to, uh, and to how we handle, how we, how we process it, how it's produced. The EU Commission in, in Europe, um, we work a lot on these interlinkages, of course. The EU Commission has also outlined the links between um, food security, climate uh, crisis and biodiversity loss, biodiversity loss. As the government in Austria, we work a lot uh, on these issues, on the interlinkages. Elizabeth has mentioned some of them with the agricultural programs, with our plan for uh, sustainable public procurement where we um, want to increase uh, the regional and seasonal sourcing, but also the organic sourcing of food. So we have a 55% organic quota until 2030. Um, we work against food waste uh, in, in a lot of different areas, and I will not go into all the detail uh, that, um, that we work. It goes from biodiversity to as a sustainable procurement, to um, consumer consciousness programs, to programs on food waste, up until I'm responsible also for space. So using space data for sustainable agriculture, it's really a wide variety of things that we work on. We have um, 
an overall goal. And I listened carefully also to the experience from Sweden, which sounds very inspiring. We have an overall goal to produce, to process and to consume food more sustainably and to produce less food waste in general. And last but not least, I'd like to mention a fact that also our um, moderator already alluded to. Of course, every single one of you in this uh, conference can make a difference by discussing the issue, by, by working on the issue, by organizing a conference like that, but also can make a difference in contributing to the solution in everyday life. Because our diet, it is uh, important for climate and for our health reasons. So if you look at the Austrian numbers, 20 to 30 percent of greenhouse gas emissions in Austria are caused by the by nutrition, by our food systems, from the production to the to the processing, to the cooking, to waste. Big problem in Austria. We're working on it a lot. Um, so, of course, we also have to look at that, because if we want to achieve the, the Paris goals, then we also have to work on nutrition that goes at the same time well for the planet and uh, and well to our own health. Um, so but to conclude, because I'm, I'm already at the end of my 10 minutes, I think, I hope I was able to also give you a bit of an insight. Um, of, of course, if you work on climate action, on biodiversity loss, on all the issues I tackled, then you focus a lot of the, on the problems and on the big challenges we have. And oh my God, how are we ever going to manage all of this? But if you ask me what gives, what gives me hope that we, we will be able to do so, that's when I'm in conferences like this with young people like you, because uh, you are the generation that's not only the best educated generation in the world, but you are also a generation that understands the complex linkages between the many different crises that we currently have. And um, that's, that's really always encouraging. So I'm really also looking forward to the debate um, it, because as Antonio Guterres said last year, we must end the war on our planet. He used very harsh words to, uh, to portray what's going on. We must end the war on our planet, and, but food systems, food systems can help us build that peace. And I think this is what I hope the, the thought that will also lead you through the, uh, through the two days of this conference, uh, just two days, right? It is, or just one, one, one day, sorry. <laughs> so the one day of this conference, because if we strengthen the resilience of our local food systems um, to external shocks, if we support food sovereignty, sovereignty, prosperity, well-being, the prosperity of our farmers and food workers, and indeed the billions of people worldwide who depend on the industry for their livelihoods, um, I think there's a lot of work to do, but there's a lot of gain, a lot to gain from the from this change. And I think your generation has really realized there's no time to lose; that the time to act is now. So thanks a lot for for putting this um, this big issue on our on our plates today. And I wish you really an interesting conference and a lot of food for thought over the next day. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Minister Gebersle. It's really like you said, really encouraging words, and we really appreciate taking time, especially in times like this, like you already pointed out correctly, it's, it's really not an easy time, and even therefore we even more appreciate everyone taking the time and being here and contributing to our conference. I would like to also further stress once more, um, please feel free to, to, to raise questions at any time, because we would like to have the conference as interactive as possible. So therefore, um, feel free to reach out anytime and raise your questions. Um, we would like to start with the first question to Minister Köstinger. So therefore, just to open um, the panel a bit more and to open the floor for questions and interaction, we would like to ask you, so how do you perceive Austria's role in contributing to a more sustainable food production in the future while facing climate change and also declining resources would be our first question thank you so much um well that's, that's quite an interesting question um if we um consider the figures the agricultural sector in austria is responsible for 10 percent uh, of total greenhouse gas emissions so um Taking in mind how important food supply for all of our daily life is, um, uh, we of course see um, that uh, the amount, uh, especially in Austria, due to a lot of measures the farmers already fulfilled, um, is, is quite a little one. 
But our clear objective uh, is to keep the emissions in agriculture low while maintaining, of course, a productive agriculture in uh, Austria um, that ensures food security. And uh, this is not only the, game, the, the aim for, for Austria, that has to be the target uh, for EU food production as such. Um, around 40% um, of the common agricultural um, policy funds from 2023 on will be earmarked for um, climate uh, and uh, environment related measures. And although there's always a huge debate, especially from NGOs, because too less, too little, too late, uh, we see that there is a big shift in the political strategy in European Union uh, agricultural policy. And this, this is really a, a, a huge success. And I'm following uh, CEP um, debates uh, and um, for, for many, many years. Um, and the awareness for um, tackle climate change and combat climate change is a huge one. And um, of course, it needs time to implement all these systems. So Austrian farmers, um, are really considered as a role model um, throughout Europe. We have uh, the highest amount of organic food production um, in the European Union. Um, and uh, this is because of our um, quite big export markets. So we do not uh, supply or sell, uh, especially the organic food in Austria on the local market. We need to export it, especially uh, to Germany, but also other states. 80%, um, and this is a very, very successful figure of farms participate in uh, this um, voluntary uh, agri-environmental program. Um, this is one of the highest numbers within the European Union, and it shows um, how much consciousness is uh, within the Austrian farmers um, that especially environment, biodiversity is a big issue um, for all of us. And according to the Federal Environment Agency, Austria uh, reduced its um, agricultural greenhouse uh, emissions for the fourth uh, consecutive time um, between, I think, 1990 and 2019. Um, we have been reduced uh, by over 14%. If you consider the transport sector, uh, the same amount uh, increased. So, um, we have a lot um, to do, especially in the next years, in the next decades, that's absolutely clear. Um, but I, I, I think the path is the right one and we have to do it with our farmers, we have to do it with the society um, to, to make it really uh, successful. But uh, we always have to uh, keep these outstanding achievements in mind, um, otherwise people will lose their faith and they will uh, always have the impression that they can do whatever they want, they will be punished for producing food, for producing meat, whatever. Uh, and I think this is the wrong way also to communicate with the farmers, we have to take them with us. Thank you so much, Minister Kostinger, for taking the time for our question. Maybe now I would like to go over to Ms. Um, Minister Giversler again, and therefore we would like to ask, um, the climate crisis and our continued efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emission can be seen in various different areas. So looking at the food industry and food consumption patterns in Austria, which changes will we see in the upcoming years regarding the food we eat every day and consume? What are your thoughts about that? Thank you. Thanks a lot for the question. I mean, if you look at the overall picture, um, Austria is really in a, catch, a catching up phase in climate action. We are one of the only six countries um, in Europe that in the EU, uh, to be more precise, that, that hasn't managed to reduce emissions in the last uh, 30 years since 1990. And as Elizabeth pointed out, the development is rather uneven over the sectors. So um, transport is the big trouble child in, in, uh, in our climate balance sheet. So we're working a lot on, on, on transport, but also there, there's a lot of interlinkages to the food systems. If you plan infrastructure for public transport, it's less 
um, space uh, intensive, so we safeguard more space for agricultural production, to give just one example. But uh, of course, now we're moving to the next stage. The next stage is climate neutrality and climate neutrality by 2040 is our goal because catching up means we also need to be a bit more ambitious. And climate neutrality means net zero and means net zero for all sectors. And of course, that's a, that, that is a big task, that that's a big challenge and nobody's naive and thinks it's easy. So it means we need a lot of, uh, a lot of action, interconnected, uh, interconnected action. We need to be very coherent in what we do across sectors in order to, um, in order to, uh, to achieve this goal. And in terms of, um, of agriculture, of course, as I mentioned before, there is, um, there is a, and also Elizabeth mentioned before, yeah, the, the, there is a clear interlink interlinkage if we fight climate, Agriculture is the first one to be affected, the first one who's, who feels the, the, the impacts of runaway climate crisis in their daily lives and in their daily livelihoods, especially in the global south, but also in Europe. Agriculture is dependent on, on, on a good and diverse and intact uh, biodiversity and, and na na nature system. So there's a lot of interlinkages that we have to um, that we have to um, that we have to consider because we are also beyond the time where we can pitch one against the other. We need to make sure that we have stable and secure food systems and respect biodiversity and solve the climate crisis. So that's not easy either. It's a, it's a, in German, the word is Gratwanderung. I'm very sorry, I cannot translate that yet. If somebody can translate it, put it in the chat. Uh, it's, it's, it's in every decision you have to, to see how to best do it. Do we always find perfect solutions? I'm not sure, but it's in every single decision. You have to consider all these interlinked crises and challenges to make sure you do the right decisions. So what do we focus on at the moment in, in terms of, uh, of, the, of the food system? Of course, Elizabeth's ministry is the main, the ministry mainly responsible for food systems. I approach it from two angles, mostly from, from my ministry that's uh, on biodiversity. Um, linkages to biodiversity. So we're working on a new biodiversity strategy and the biodiversity uh, fund um, that um, helps us to have uh, also uh, resilient and intact ecosystems also for our food production. We, it's actually more than two approaches. <laughs> we work a lot on the, uh, on circular economy uh, policies, on, on uh, also on the linkage I gave you to spatial planning, um, we focus on uh, the, the food waste across the whole value chain because food waste is a big, is a big issue. Um, and that leads me to, um, sorry, taking a bit long to come to the concrete question. And that leads me to the fact that we also in our ministry um, work a lot on consumer awareness. Because uh, as I mentioned earlier, each and every one of us has a role to play in this and can play, uh, can, can have a role to play. This is not an excuse for not taking political action. We need clear and coherent political action at the European level, at national level, but each and every one of us has a role to play. In food waste, um, we have, if you look at, at the, uh, the European numbers in, in Europe, we have around 173 kilos of food that's that lands in the trash bin every year, 173 kilos of food per person in a world where we have people who starve. So it's, it's, it's an ecological issue, it's a moral issue, it's, it's, it's really, that's, that's really a big problem to tackle. And also there individually, we have a role to play. And the second big part in, um, in uh, consumer awareness is of course the question, what um, role do our diets play? And uh, I think if we, there's a lot of interlinkages with also the Ministry of Health and Social Affairs because diets that are healthy for the planet because they are more plant-based, they have less red meat, they, um, they take care that we are not, um, that, that we source um, sustainably and, and support local farmers and seasonal production. They are not only healthy for the planet, they're not only healthy for farmers, but they're they also healthy for ourselves. And I think this question of, of less is more, less food waste 
less meat dependency, but more variety and uh, and uh, and a more healthy diet. I, this is another aspect that I will that that we focus on a lot. And you see a shift. You see a shift in in consumer behavior. Also, Elizabeth outlined that before towards regional production. You see a shift towards more vari varied diets. So that's also what we try to support. Thank you so much, Minister Gewessler. And uh, once more, please don't feel sorry for um, taking a bit of time. Um, I think we're happy for your contribution and also since it's a highly interesting and also yeah, actual topic at the moment. Therefore, yeah, we're happy about every contribution. Um, also, you are one of our um, participants kindly translated Gratwanderung for all our international um, audience. So it's meaning balancing act. So <laughs> once more, thank you so much, therefore. Um, furthermore, once again, I would like to stress out that please feel free to contribute to the conference. Um, I think it's a great opportunity. We have um, so many great participants here. Um, so therefore, um, I see. Okay, perfect. We now have a question for Minister Köstinger. If environmental protection is so important, how can it be that Austria has helped to completely water down the bill to collect um, pesticides data in agriculture, one of the central goals of the Green Deal? Uh, well, actually, that's uh, that's not uh, that's not true, and um, um, we have a um, really clear national strategy to reduce uh, pesticides, um, and uh, the path is also clear. Um, we want to use as many as um, we need, but uh, um, we. Uh, will always um, put a lot of um, science and development um, in new forms and new ways, um, which means uh, especially for, for crop production, which is the major affected um, sector or branch of, uh, and the need for um, pesticides. Since um, I think 2011, the use of pesticides uh, has been reduced by 15%. Um, so we are much more um, efficient um, and um, we have a lot of strategies to um, give advice to the farmers uh, and um, make clear really clear frameworks at all. Um, what is mentioned in the Green Deal and especially in the Farm to Fork strategy uh, is a amount of reducing pesticides by 50%. Uh, and this is not quite logical because the amount says nothing about the impact of the pesticide. Um, one of the um, biggest amount we have to use in Austria, which is under the regulation is CO2 emission. Uh, for keeping food fresh, especially vegetables um, and um, um, uh, vegetables and apples and whatever. So uh, this is uh, the biggest amount. If it is, would be easy for Austria to reduce by 50% uh, if we do not use CO2 uh, anymore for keeping um, uh, all this uh, uh, food uh, and stuff fresh. But this doesn't say anything about the impact of the environment, uh, especially when it comes to other substances. And this was what Austria um, was criticizing within uh, the all over debate uh, to the farm to fork strategy. So on the one hand, we have our clear vision, our clear path on the national level, and uh, we want to contribute on the European level, but not only by cutting percentages, uh, but by really looking deep into the substances, uh, into the amount, and this is the only way how um, we can be successful at all. And the second thing is uh, when it comes to free trade agreements. We are um, quite keen in uh, Europe and also in Austria to put higher standards, uh, to demand a lot from farmers, biodiversity, animal welfare, um, a lot of climate measures, environment measures. And then European Commission in, is negotiating a free trade agreement with Mercosur um, countries. Deforestation uh, is one of the biggest uh, issue. Uh, there are so many substances they can use uh, in producing food, uh, 
especially meat production there, um, has a big impact on, on climate change. Uh, and this is the quite um, stupid thing on the whole, um, uh, on the whole strategy of the European Union that we on the one side um, hinder our farmers in Europe and uh, especially in Austria to produce food and punish them for do that in some ways and then we import um, really cheap stuff from outside European Union uh, and this is something uh, which cannot work uh, and this is uh, what I, as Minister for Agriculture and responsible for the future of our family-run farms, uh, is always uh, pointing out. And this is why I do not uh, raise my hand uh, if it's um, perhaps uh, a mainstream issue and topic, but we have to dive deeper and uh, we have to find real solutions and not only uh, newspaper headlines. Uh, this is not enough. Thank you so much, Minister Köstinger, for answering the question. We have a further question in our chat um, to Minister um, Gewessler. To have regional food is a logic way to deal with the climate crisis and many other aspects um, of sustainability. But thinking if raspberries from Morocco, how important is our trade with non-seasonal food for the economies of these faraway countries? Very good question. One of the balancing acts that we see in the debate, um, because of course, um, international trade uh, has two sides uh, to it. Um, and um, even though I see many of the aspects critical, you cannot negate that it has an impact on the on the uh, economies of um, of also the, the countries, for example, in the global south. For Morocco, I cannot I cannot give you the correct the 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 correct number. Uh, I have to uh, I have to admit, yeah. But I think uh, picking up from where Elizabeth uh, left off, I think what's extremely important is that we are coherent in our policy making, and so coherent means what we do internally, we must also do externally. There is no way. I, I mean. You know, in the conventional debate on on what's the problem in biodiversity and what's the problem in the climate crisis, you have a lot of people saying, "Well, it's not me. I'm only X, Y, Z percent. Uh, Europe is so small and cannot make a difference." That's just not true. We can make a huge difference if we use all the levers we have at hand. And so, the question how we design our trade agreements is 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 crucial. <laughs> it's. It's, we, cannot, we cannot think Green Deal only internally. We must think it also globally and also design the, uh, the, the, our, our trade relations with this in mind. Of course, this again is a balancing act because um, we have very different levels of, of development and of, of, of practices um, globally. So you have to really look into, the, into this. Yeah, But um, especially in an agricultural a trade, I think there is, uh, and in, in treating agriculture in, uh, um, in, uh, in trade agreements, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if we haven't overweighed the export interests of, of agri uh, the export interests over what's the impact uh, locally in the last years. So if in the sense of the Green Deal, if we can, in the sense of uh, sustainable food systems globally, we can make that switch also in thinking about uh, trade agreements, then it's good. And so it's very clear, and thanks Elizabeth for pointing that out. Mercosur is just a no-go. Yeah? You cannot live in a world with 21st century problems and then uh, make 20th century trade agreements. So um, yeah. Thank you so much, Minister Gewessler. Looking at the time, um, we are now coming to the end of our opening panel. So therefore, we'd like to show our sincere appreciation to Federal Minister Elisabeth Köstinger, Federal Minister Leonore Gewessler, and also Ambassador Annika Markovic and Ambassador Ermi Briggs for taking the time um, today and also for answering our numerous questions and really contributing to our conference. And we highly appreciate it. Um, furthermore, some information we would like to remind you that you can find our timetable in the booklet. So it will also be displayed 
displayed on the screen during the breaks. So the upcoming panel will be on STG2, Zero Hunger, and will start at 10.50 a.m. So from our side and speaking for all um, the presidents and um, our team as well, for the heads and members, it's an honor to host such a great amount of people and here today. And we invite all of you to join our next panels in 15 minutes. And yeah, we really, once again, highly appreciate that you took the time. We know it's it's not an easy situation at the moment and therefore Evie even more appreciated. And it was, was a great first panel and um, thank you so much once again. And yeah, hopefully to see you soon and take care and have a nice day.